Thanks for coming and joining us. It's, Thank it's you. always good to see you all. It's, uh, and it's a pleasure. I'm sorry. Thank you for your patience because we had a few unexpected happenings, but hey, it worked out okay. And we're really, you know, I'm Lou Mamaletti, who is our water department superintendent, stepped in at the last minute because Dave Schofield, who had intended to be here, had a last minute conflict. So Dave will come and visit us in June. But next month, um, Reverend Boylan will be here to you know, talk local history again. So, But I, I called Lou literally like, you know, with like a day's notice and said, can you can pinch it? And he very kindly <laughs> said that he could. So I, I really appreciate him. I appreciate you doing that. No problem. I'm happy to do it. Um, I want to tell you, though, you know, while I've got uh, you together, we're, we're, going, we're going forward with a new senior community center. Things are happening. We've got a general contractor in place that's ambient technology from Newburyport. Uh, the kids, the carpentry students from Whittier began the demolition in the two rooms that are going to be you know, remodeled. The first classroom will be that we're using as the entranceway and administrative office and, and reception area. They did demolition in the ceiling and, um, and some of the walls and began steel um, framing. And then the classroom that abuts the, ca the uh, cafeteria, which will be, you know, allow us some private meeting areas for things like our blood pressure clinic and our health insurance counseling, our tax prep. They started framing in there. So, I mean, it's really, you know, you're starting to see things and, and to see the reality of what it will be. And uh, we had um, the Community Preservation Committee is going to recommend <coughs> at town meeting 125000 from their funds. And the Finance Committee unanimously supported 50000 from stabilization. So that will give us the money. And that will actually be a separate vote. It will be a special before the annual. But together, that matches the money that town meeting approved in the fall. So we'll have. We try to make sure that people here can get their friends and families and whatever, whoever can vote, come voting time. Yeah. yeah, but it's, I mean, things are coming together, and, and yeah, and so the two votes will be, you know, on May 2nd at the town, town meeting. The special will be just before the annual, and it will flow right into the annual, but yes, support's important, but that will give what we need to be able to finish financing the rest of the work. I, I think that we probably won't be done until the fall, but you know what, that's okay. It's, it's going to be done. And whatever, you know, whatever the time frame is, the time frame is. And, you know, I always say to my kids, anybody can do anything for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Ten years wasn't too long to wait. <laughs> so, but, so that was good. I just wanted to share that while I had, had everybody together. Because I think it's, it's very exciting seeing the pieces come together and, and the different components, you know, of everybody that's been involved. The school department has still been doing things to help a lot, you know, they moved, you know, heating pipes, you know, Mike Anderson moved heating pipes so the kids could do their work. So it's like, you know, working in partnership. So it's been fabulous. But I'm taking cutting into your time. No, no. So. I'm standing here and continuing to be inspired by how hard you work. <laughs> <laughs> and well. hoping like heck I can hold up that, you know, my end of, um, for what I do. You do. You do. Good try. Seriously. Well, um, so he's got lots of, you know, updates to give you on. I heard some of it yesterday in our meeting, so thank you. I'm going to clean up having. some stuff. And Tonight, I'm started by giving you a gold star. Okay. <laughs> I sure. was back here in the 60s living in Georgetown. And the older that we got from the water system, that was sort of the topic of conversation at that time. That has completely flipped around 180 degrees in the opposite direction. And uh, the last, I don't know, five, 10 years, we've had uh, no problems at all. So that's a, been a big step on, on the water department's part. Well, I think we have to, we'd have to take that gold star and cut it up into a lot of pieces and, yeah. and give it a lot of people a piece of that. But, and I think that, um, like anything, you need mm -hmm. a number of people all with the same ideas um, they don't always have to agree, but they all have to be sort of going in the right direction with a common purpose. And I think um, the board's always been fortunate to have good membership, people that care about what they're doing. Um, the current board, um, I think, has tried to advance that even further. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to have the people that are there. Is the Marshall Wells still going? Yes, it is. Actually, 
we, we actually just took it offline to uh, to rehabilitate it because the uh, wells have to be rehabilitated every few years yeah. um, to kind of bring back the specific capacity. It's basically, how much water you can get in a vertical foot when it draws down when the well is running, and uh, you know we track that to see how it performs. It's like it's like any mechanical device. You keep track of it. It's, it's like tuning up your car or uh, rebuilding a motor. Yeah. Same, it's the same idea. You, you're trying to get more performance out of something. So every once in a while, you need to give it a little, you know, um, a little maintenance, and that's what we did. Um, but just to finish that thought is, um, it's not just the, the board members; it's also the people that work there. Um, you know, um, I think there's a perception, you know, from the public that public sector folks, uh, you know, they make a lot of money and they don't do a whole lot. You know, I came from the private sector. I spent 20 years in the engineering world. I spent five years in the construction world after that, and now almost three years here. So I've had a chance to see different areas. And we, we have people that work very hard. They work as hard as other industries that I've been in. Um, but it's not always an easy business because you have a lot of critics and a lot of people to, um, to make happy and to make satisfied, people who pay the bills. Um, and you know, just like if you went and bought something in the store and it wasn't didn't fit right or a stitch and ripped or something like that, I mean, you'd, you'd look at it and say, "Hey, I paid good money for this. How come it isn't the way it's supposed to be?" And you know, we have that we have those same challenges. So we try to take this what we do seriously, and we try to do the best we can. In the meantime, the op off uh, the operation never stops. So when something goes wrong, like a water main break or something with a filter at the treatment plant you know we're fixing these things on the fly we don't we don't send out a uh, you know a robocall call and say everybody stop using water until we get this right you know it's like the central lobby they built it while everybody was still driving through it and so that you know that it's like there's a constant challenge there um, so I'd like to think that our efforts have helped make things better but I think it's a it's kind of been a progression since I've been here We've done a few things that hadn't been done in the past, or maybe not quite in the same manner. And we've also kept track of what the quality of the water is. So I think we can point to specific things that we've done um, at times when the trending of the water quality shows improvements. And we can make a reasonable correlation that those, those improvements are based upon actions that we've taken. But like anything else, you can't stop and say, okay, the problem is solved. You know, every single day we're check checking the water quality. Every single month we're around sampling throughout the town. Um, so, you know, it's sort of a never ending story. Um, but you don't have the same problem that you had 40, 50 years ago, or at least. Some least of the, I, I mean, there are some people that tell me that, uh, many people who tell me that the water quality used to be fantastic. It did, it was. And, and, then, it, and then it diminished. And I think you could probably correlate that in some ways to the growth of the town. Um, in most communities, like if you go out down south or out to the west, where they plan communities, they lay out all kinds of infrastructure, and then they build a community based upon what they think. In the northeast part of the country, we build and then get the infrastructure behind it. And, and if, you're, if you're reactionary to infrastructure, after people have already spent all the money on their houses, yeah. It's, it, it's, it's, it's not a recipe that works. And so we've, you know, we've had to kind of reformulate that. Um, and, we, and we're trying to do that as well. Um, so one of the key steps that goes along with that is to analyze the hydraulics of how your system works. Um, way back, uh, there were two fellas. One's last name was Hardy. The other one's last name was Cross. And they created this method called the Hardy-Cross method. And basically, it was to analyze the hydraulics in a water system um, on a big sheet of paper. That back when eraser stock was going through the roof, because guys were erasing things all the time and recalculating. Now we have computers, and uh, the computers have algorithms built into them that can look at things faster than humans can and analyze them in a no, sort of a nonstop way. So one of the areas where we've done, that's been done in the civil engineering world, is to create this thing called hydraulic modeling. Um, and basically what it is, it's a computerized representation of how the 
pipe network works and how water goes in and out of the system. So what you see up here is um, a graphical representation of the computer model that, we, that, that has been created for the town. And basically what this is, is it's a series of pipes and junctions um, laid out in a fashion that looks just like the street layout of the town. And then behind it are different layers of information, like, like topographic information, uh, public rights of way, like where the streets are, the layout of the highway, um, and other various features. Um, so the first thing that has to happen is, is you take this information and you draw it into the computer so somebody can actually sit there and, 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 and draw and connect all the dots. And that's much like a regular drawing program. But the features in the program are actually active. So once you create a, once you create a graphical image of the system, you can actually apply information to each of the pieces. So one of the things you do um, is you identify where the water comes into the system. So in our town, the water comes into the system. Um, here's the center of the town. Uh, this is end of the street <coughs> on the hill. And this is West Street opposite the golf course that leads down to where our wells are. So water enters our water system through three wells. One of them is called Marshall Well, one of them is called Duffy's Landing, and the third one is referred to as Commissioner's Well. You actually access that off of Bailey Lane, um, basically opposite where we are right now, opposite West Main Street. Um, and there's an access driveway that leads in. Water flows water gets pumped from that well across country and then connects in with the wet water from the other two wells before it goes in the treatment plant. So in this computer model, we basically put in information related to the pumps so that the computer can understand how much water enters the system when the, when the pumps are running. Um, water goes into the system and either gets used by people, and we call that demand, or consumption, or the excess goes into storage. And the town has three water storage tanks. The first one was the one that was built originally for the system in 1935. If you're coming back into town, um, you see it on the right hand side on 133, just beyond the golf course. I think somebody wrote Georgetown up there once a long time ago. You see that. Well, that that's on ball paper. Right? So the um, that's on ball page, sort of near the end of Andover Street. Um, that tank has 300,000 gallons in it. We have two other tanks further down ball page road behind ball page hospital. Those, each of those two tanks is 600,000 gallons. So six, six, and three, so it's 1.5 million gallons of water that we can store. Um, the pumps in our system, uh, like most communities, are controlled by the elevation of the water in the tank. So it's, it's kind of like a, similar to like a sump pump in a basement. When the water level gets to a certain point, the height of the water tells the pump to turn itself on. Well, in our case, it's the opposite. When the height of the water gets too low in the tank, what it said, it tells the, it tells the wells, I need more water to keep up with the demand of the people that are using the water. And so that's how it's controlled. When I first got here, one of the issues was the water in the concrete tanks wasn't moving up and down at the same rate as the water in the in the smaller tank. <coughs> and so what happened is the water in the bigger tanks would stay there for longer periods of time. When you when water stays in one place for a long period of time, it can stagnate. If there's any chlorine residual, which is what we put into the water, some of that dissipates with time. And so anything that's naturally occurring in the water that would otherwise be inactivated by the by the Chlorine, which disinfects the water, can you know can come back around. Um, so there's all, there's 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 always a, there's always challenges to having enough storage for when you need it versus having water sitting there and getting stagnant. So the, one of the things that we did was we shut the tank, the smaller tank, off because theoretically we actually have enough water in storage already without that tank. And what it did is it forced it forced us to use level 
the levels in the other tank to operate, in which case, suddenly now, the levels in the tank, we can control to go up and down. So we reduce the age of the water in the system, and that, that definitely had a positive benefit throughout the system. So once that was in place, then we started to try to look at, at some other areas. Um, another area that we did was we put mixers in the other con in the concrete tanks, and that basically turned the water around and made it more homogeneous. And we can see evidence when we did that that there was there were positive benefits in the water quality in the system. When you store the water, I was curious: did you do you already have it filtered before it goes into the? It's it's, it's finished water. It's treated. Okay. Yes. Because it, from what I understand, I know very little bit about this, but. It's minerals within the soil that bring up some of these uh, problem areas. And how do you manage to filter that out? Well, the, the, the treatment process, um, the, the treatment process is designed to remove iron and manganese. Um, we get a little bit of removal of other things, but that's not really intended cause. It just it sort of just happens. Um, but once it's into the system, the treatment aspect has already been implemented. So what, what we were looking at in that case is just the water just sitting there for too long and, and aging out, and the, and the longer it ages, uh, you know, the, um, the more problems get created with water quality out in the system. So we've done a few other things along the way. Some of them are related to the treatment process. One of the other key things is, is we started adding a little bit more chlorine. We actually had chlorine in two spots in the treatment process, one before our filters one after our filters. When we added, started adding it before the filters a little bit higher, we also saw some changes in the water quality as well. And so what that suggests is that there's, there's some benefits there to, to, um, to adding a little bit more chlorine. Chlorine gets consumed in water by things that demand it. We refer to that as chlorine demand. Um, so one theory is, is that there are some other things demanding chlorine that weren't getting enough that were then passing through the system and creating issues out in the, out in the distribution system. So that's really helped a lot. And there's been a few other mechanical changes that we've made, very subtle, but in general they're, they're intended to, uh, to help improve the performance of the plant so that the water that enters the system is as clean as it can be. If something happens to the pumping system that you get water into those storage areas, how long will the amount of water we had in the storage, how long would that last? I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm gonna go through that in, in some little detail, but in general there are there are specific requirements that you have to meet in order to have adequate amount of storage. And some of that um, some of that is a function of your readiness. So if your operators lived a day's drive away and you didn't have any backup power, well then you'd need a whole lot more water because your recovery time would be so much greater. You know, we have, you know, we, we have three operators. The one lives 45 minutes away, one lives 20 minutes away, one lives 10 minutes away. So our readiness is, is much better, and, and you know that's, that's fairly typical in our industry to have people that live reasonably close by. It's similar to needing firemen to be close by the station. So, yes. Do you have backup generation for all the pumps? Yes, we do. We, I mean, that's the other part of the readiness. We, have, um, we actually have uh, uh, propane-fired um, engines uh, that engage through a right-angle drive system to basically take over for the electricity and the electricity is what's the primary power. So yes, the answer is yes, we do. And that, again, talks to the readiness of our system. So um, in general, I don't want to bore you with a whole lot of super fine details, but in general, when you make a, a hydraulic model, you need to let the computer understand how the water enters the system and how water leaves the system and where the water goes in the interim. So water entering the system, that's your pumps and your treatment water being used in the system, that's your demand. Water being stored in the system later on, that's your storage. And so what we, what's been done for this model um, is to identify throughout the system where the demand is. We work with an engineering firm, some folks that I've known for a while that, that are, are very good at this. 
Um, but what they didn't have is the local knowledge, and that's where we sort of came in because we provided information about you know the density of different areas, what our water billing system says for records as to what people use in what areas. So we tried to make these sort of zones, and some of those are really similar to the um, the zoning, you know, uh, the, the the land density, um, you know, two acre zoning, one acre zoning, quarter acre zoning. Um, but we also have that we also have it backed up by actual water consumption data, which we utilize for that. Plus, we also identify the ten largest users of water, <clears throat> and that information was all taken and put into the model in an active manner such that the model could use that information to understand how water moves through the system by knowing where it wants to go. When, when there's a fire and, and the fire department opens up a hydrant and calls for 1,200 gallons a minute, they're basically asking for the amount of water that the whole town would use but um, on a unit basis, but they're asking for it in a short burst of time. So basically what happens is, is no matter who's using water, a great deal of the water wants to immediately go to that hydrant because it's the, it's the path of least resistance, it's the greatest demand. So for instance, when there was a fire in over at Long Hill about eight or nine years ago, um, a lot of the localized areas, I live on Marlboro Road right here, and the fire was over here. So the water pressure actually dropped and that's specifically due to the fact that the that there was a higher demand. And that's typical in a lot of systems. The question is, is, is there an acceptable amount of drop such that you still maintain um, appropriate level of service even when you have these higher demands? And that's really what the model tries to predict. We also go out into the system and test that theory by checking the pressures at all the, at, at different key hydrants, running the, running the water at high rates, um, to check how, how the system um, operates. And so what we do is we check the real world conditions against the predicted conditions that the model creates. And then we adjust those, uh, we adjust certain information within the model to get the model to predict it the way it really works in the system. And that's referred to as calibration. It's like, like, a, like any kind of machine or a meter. You know what something should be and you're trying to help the machine understand boundary conditions such that you can make the machine understand how it really works in the, in the real world. And that's basically what the model does. Um, in the process of doing this, we also identify certain things about our system. For instance, um, if you go way out into the system, uh, like at the upper ends of North Street, say beyond um, Thurlow Street. So this is in the area up near like Erie 4 Fire Station. or in the, I call it the triangle, the, the triangle bounded roughly by Jackman Street, Warren Street, and Jewish Street. In those two areas, the water pressure is significantly higher than the rest of the town. Um, Gary will tell you that um, he's got first-hand experience with that. Um, the water pressure in these areas exceeds 115 pounds per square inch. Most houses work somewhere in the 60 to 90 range, and that's reasonable. Um, but we also have some areas in town, specifically up at the higher elevations, um, near Ballpate Road, and some upper sections of Andover Street, where the water pressure is lower um, than the average, and those are down in the 40 to 50 psi range. What are the advantages or disadvantages, say, to well, what, what happens is, is you, um, fixtures and internal plumbing systems, they like consistency and they're rated in a certain way that they mechanically operate better in, a, in that range of 60 to 90. When, it's, when something's higher, you can have surges or you can have things that exceed the, um, not, not what they're rated for, but what they like to operate at to be able to operate consistently without mechanical failure. Um, on the lower side, um, it's more of a, it's more driven by um, the quality of service. You know, if, uh, if you're trying to take a shower and the water's not coming out as, as fast as you would like it, or you're trying to water a garden or something and, and you don't, and you, the hose can't go as far as, as you need to. Um, 
so there are things that you can do to change that. Um, localized changes seem to be what has been put in place in most of these areas. A lot of folks up in these areas have pressure reducing um, devices within their, within their plumbing of their own houses. And a lot of folks in these areas have boosted systems where water fills at the lower pressure and is stored locally <coughs> in the building and then boosted when they need it. And, and that's just a mechanical assistance. Um, on Long Hill, uh, we actually have a booster station, which is sort of a, a community version of the localized system that you would find in an individual house. Um, so when the pressure gets lower than uh, whatever the set point is, pumps uh, add mechanical, you know, add, add energy into the system mechanically to boost the pressure. Um, and that, so I refer to that as a booster system or a booster station. So the model understands all these things and is used to basically try to predict how things will work. Now we try to have certain performance. Um, we try to have certain fire flow capabilities in different areas. And, um, and the model helps to understand where those things are. So if it's an area, you know, a particular building, like a school or a factory or, or um, a hospital or some kind of a place that may have greater fire flow demands or needs, you try to have localized capabilities there from the water system to give the fire department the ability to do that. So we've been using the model to help identify areas where we need to make some improvements. Um, and we're going to kind of follow up on those, um, you know, moving forward. It's a long range plan, so it's not like, you know, in one day you, you make the whole thing better. Um, but it's sort of a target that you work towards, um, knowing that the improvements are needed. We have a water system that was started in 1935, and we've never replaced the pipe in the town's history. So every pipe that's in the ground is the pipe that went in the day. It's still the same pipe as the day it went in. Didn't um, they uh, put cement inside the pipes? Yeah, they they did. Clean them. They, they, them. Yeah. they did. Yeah. They did. They did. They um that they refer to that as cleaning and lining, and so um uh, that's what they call trenchless technology, where you. I mean, there's still some of the trenches you have to have access pits to get into the ground. But the idea is it's not to have to rip up all the roads. And a lot of that was done in 1977, if I remember. Yeah. Yes? I keep hearing, uh, because of the controversial possible effort that we had in town, about a possible connector pipe from somewhere off North Street, I'll say off Sill Street. Yes. Now, what would be the benefits of that? Why would it be needed? Would it help with the low pressure at Long Hill, or um, is it just a loop? No, it's 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 more of a it's more of a loop configuration. I think where you're referring to right now is um, there's a there's a new area that was built in here, yeah. and I think the idea was to be able to, to connect from here to here. Yeah. Um, Right now, the water, there's a water loop that does this, and there's some smaller loops internally that help, but this is, would be yet another path. Um, I think the controversy, um, I want to be delicate. I don't think there was a need to be for a controversy, because I think, at least in terms of the connectivity, all we wanted, to, all the water department would need is an understanding that at some point wouldn't be it would be advantageous for the whole town to be able to connect the pipe through there. That pipe will be five and a half feet under the ground, and after you leave in a few weeks, you'd never even know anybody was there. So, uh, the, the changing the pristine nature of the area, I mean, it's already a wetland, so really, nobody owns the wetlands, no matter what parcel it's on, because you can't build them. I, I was just thinking, you know, what's so. The, the benefits of a loop, they stop the dead ends in the high pressure areas. And yeah, I mean, any, anytime you loop something, you're creating, you're creating continued movement of the water, and it's similar to what was in the tank, is if you have something stopped in one location and no demand, then you create stagnation, and, and this would be an instance where you could help that. Um, in the priorities of the town and the water department, it's relatively low. Okay. But the whole idea of easements are they're, they're secured at a time when you're thinking out proactively into the future as to what would be needed. 
and, and, you, and sort of a set aside to make sure that someday when it's needed, you've got all your kind of issues in order where, where it would be allowed. And I, I think that's really the issue. I, you mean the landowners have been contacted or spoken to? Like yeah, that? I mean an easement, you could have an easement on your property or a lot of people have drainage easements at the back of their property where it's, where it's identified that the town could come in and, and clear something so there's flood mitigation. Um, I mean, this, I'm not specifically sure where in town we have it, but I've worked in a lot, of, uh, when I, in my civil engineering days, I worked in the communities. Drake, it has a whole lot of roads. <coughs> a lot of Drake, it was farms, and then it, everybody just started making subdivisions on farms. So there's a lot of those that exist there. Um, you know, so I, I think that's really, I don't think, it really didn't need to be, in terms of the water department anyways, it really didn't need to be much of a controversy. It just needed to be understood that at some point, and by the way, I think there's a small easement with given already that connects to that parcel and there's already a 20 foot stubble pipe aiming out of a street into into the grass area so that someday when it needs to happen you dig down find it and, and stop laying the pipe and so it's so the water department sort of did their job and uh, I think the other departments kind of just have to make sure they're all in agreement as to if it's needed someday that it can be done so um, so anyways, I talked about what the model is, and uh, in the tanks of storage, I just wanted to talk just quickly about what the storage is. Um, we, um, we look at three types of, of three components to storage. So we have three types of storage. Um, upper, middle, and lower, but it's, it's what its function is. Um, the lowest part of the storage, we'll go from the bottom up, we call it emergency storage. Um, the middle part, we call fire flow storage, and the upper part, we call equalization storage. So when you're looking at it, the water in the tank exists at certain elevations to give you certain uh, pressure out into the system at a time when it's needed. It is a gravity flow system, except for the lift station. Well, yes, we energy is added to the system at pumps that either pump it out of the ground through the treatment plant and up into the tank, right? Or uh, where it gravity flows when the pump when the system is off, uh, when when the when the wells are off until it gets down to a certain level, and the tank calls the pumps to say send me more water. In localized areas in on Long Hill specifically that's looked at just for the neighborhood where if the pressure drops too low, the system can recognize that and pumps kick on to just pump the water harder into the pipe. Um, and so the answer to your question is yes, it's, 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 it's a gravity system assisted with pumping at key, at key times in the process. Um, so when we look at these things, we try to look at, at where the storage is going. <coughs> and, um, Basically, what we've identified with the system is that um, there's adequate storage in our system um, to provide water for most locations. What we're trying to do is to identify um, whether or not we can make some improvements to the system. One of the issues that we have is we have a tank, one of the two concrete tanks that was built behind Ball Pay Hospital, built back in 1960, and structurally, it's starting to show its age. And so, you know, when you start thinking about the life cycle cost of something, you have to evaluate the cost of uh, putting expensive maintenance into something versus replacing it. It's kind of like thinking about a car. Um, if you've got a car that's got 150,000 miles on it, uh, you may not be thinking about putting a $3,000 transmission into it. You, you may be thinking about all the other things associated with it that, that would suggest that perhaps the better choice is to is to put a new one in. Um, also, to putting putting a transmission into an older vehicle doesn't necessarily guarantee all the other parts of the vehicle are going to continue to work. All it says is that the transmission works, and so that you, you, you try to focus on on those areas um, to see where the best benefit is. And so, one of the things that we're looking at right now is to decide whether or not replacing the tank is a better option than rehabilitating it. And further, 
as to whether or not rehabilit uh, either rehabilitating it in place or replacing it in the same location versus a different location, because now you have the, you have the ability to choose another location if you put a <coughs> tank. The town actually owns a piece of land on Long Hill. Um, and for about 30 years, I think there's been a sign that says there's going to be a water tank here someday. Um, so now we're at a moment in time where, you know, kind of like the easement, folks did their homework a long time ago to be ready for a time when perhaps it might be necessary to, you know, to take action in that location. So now what we're doing now is trying to look at a little bit closer, decide whether or not, you know, this is the right time. And, uh, you know, it seems like we're, again, just following a process that other people that came before us had already initiated. Um, and so that, in, in, in general, that's kind of how we look at the water system. You know, we look at the quality of the water. We look at the hydraulics of the water. We look at the water system's ability to, to meet the daily demands of people. We look at it to look at the fire flow. Um, you know, uh, God forbid somebody's house catches on fire, whether or not we're, we're ready. So um, we're working we're working very hard to keep kind of all these things in play and uh, and to look at them on a you know on an ongoing basis to help make improvements. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, what are you putting in the water? Our treatment process um, is fairly straightforward and fairly typical for New England groundwater supplies with iron. Um, we have what they refer to as a green sand plant. So green sand is, uh, what we do is we take the water out of the ground, we adjust the pH using potassium hydroxide. So we raise the pH from like six and a half to around 7.2, somewhere around there. Um, then we bring the water into the treatment plant. We do that localized at the wells. And we bring the water into the treatment plant and we oxidize the iron that's dissolved in the water. We use um, sodium hypochlorite, which is a fancy name for bleach. Um, we also oxidize the manganese that's in the water using uh, a chemical called potassium permanganate. And then we send the we, we send the, the water that's been dosed continuously through filters, and the filters have anthracite, which is a, a form of coal or charcoal, um, and green sand, which is a, I guess manganite or something. It's kind of a funky. Well, it's it's a manufactured product now that is has replaced something that was naturally occurring in the ground. Um, where they've actually been able to engineer a better, more durable product that does the same job. And so we filter that. Um, and then we dose it on the way out with, um, with some more sodium hypochlorite to deactivate any viruses that might, or, or uh, bacteria that might be in the water. And that's all, everything that we do there is all overseen by the Department of Environmental Protection. So we have to do testing throughout the town. We have to test for bacteria levels in the wells bacteria levels at all the key locations throughout town. Um, and then we also you know, we also look for iron and manganese levels and uh, chlorine residual throughout the town to make sure that the water quality we're delivering through the town stays consistent. It also helps us to identify areas that need a little bit more attention. One, one of the areas is actually the towards the dead end of West Street where, where we have some stagnation <coughs> in the water because it's just not a lot of demand down there. So in between our fall and spring flushing, we probably go down there once a month during the summer and change the water out of the pipe. Unfortunately, it's what we're, basically what we're doing is throwing away water that we treated. But we, we just don't have the ability right now to consistently get the water quality there to the same level we had in other places. You just flush the lines basically. Yeah, we, we don't rip it open like, like, like the regular flushing process. It's more it's slower. It's basically just to change it out. It would be the equivalent of everybody had more demand down there because there's just not a lot of houses. But we also have, like, uh, uh, if we could loop that, like one of the areas that we're talking about looping, finally, because it's probably something should have happened a long time ago, is the end of um, Old Jacobs Road to the end of Lake Ave where the gun club is. Yeah. Because there's a, there's, a, there's a right of way that goes through there, and it's, it would not be an expensive process to do that. You don't have to repave the road. You basically just, you know, put some grass seed back down and, and you're right back in business. 
Yeah. So, yeah. Colleen had a comment. I, yeah, I, yes. I, I think we have to wrap up because the other, the other class is here. Okay. And I'm ready to start. I, and, and but I, really I actually to took you. questions during the flow, so yeah. they <laughs> can't possibly have any more. Fantastic job. Yes. <laughs> so, anyways, that, that wraps up my presentation. But um, if anybody wants any other questions, whatever, I'll.